Welcome back to part three of this epic interview with uh, with Melinda and and uh, Sterling or Stu Brown. Uh, we have covered in the first two parts uh, their amazing time as Mormons, how much they love the church, how orthodox they were, how much the church meant to them, and then we went into depth about what caused Sterling first to kind of start losing interest and questioning his faith, and how they. Uh, how they navigated that and the mixed faith marriage, and then ultimately what um, what caused Melinda to second guess her decision to kind of stay in and be that kind of Mormon single mom, uh, so to speak, and what ended up uh, leading to both of them, both Stuart resigning and then uh, Melinda deciding to no longer continue attending and raising your kids in the church. So uh, I feel like it was just a really beautiful, classic, epic uh, faith journey that I know is going to help a lot of people. Um, but we're not going to end there. Um, what I think is one of the most important things we can do is kind of model life after uh, the faith crisis. And so often, uh, this you know, some people don't even like using the term faith crisis because it, it's a sort of negative framing. Many people say, hey, it's not a crisis. It's like a faith enlightening. It's actually... Um, this moment of awakening and and a lot of people don't even like that framing at all but at the time you experience it it certainly does feel like a crisis for most people and so um, for me as I started thinking about and as I've traveled around the world um, trying to support Mormons and liberal Mormons and post Mormons navigating a faith crisis I've come up with this idea of a new framing and the new framing that I've come up with is this idea of the gift of the faith crisis. In other words, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's different. Yes, it's going to be painful at times. Yes, sometimes it'll even be terrifying and excruciating. But, uh, but this is a gift for many, if not most, if not all of the tens of thousands of people that I've interacted with over the past 15 plus years. Um, again, it's, it's painful. It's, it's uh, terrifying. Sometimes it's, it's uh, life-threatening, sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's deeply depressing, sometimes it causes a lot of anxiety, but then the sun comes up, and over time what you can realize is that um, this can not only be something that you weather, and something that you endure, and something that you get through, but this experience, and I'll have to say, whether you stay in the church or leave the church, um, this faith crisis, what can become born out of it, is sort of a born-again experience where you literally get a new lease on life for the first time in your life. And so many exciting, wonderful things can grow from that huge stinking turd that was originally feeling like a faith crisis. And so it can be a better marriage, it can be healthy relationships with kids, it can be extended family relationships that were once lost now get rekindled. It can be feeling more authentic, feeling more true, losing a hundred pounds or losing your depression or your anxiety. All these amazing gifts can come from uh, that faith crisis um, moment. And so what we're going to do for the third part of this interview is we're going to ask Stu and Mel two questions, really. Question number one is, what were the super hard things about the faith crisis? You know, what, what were the hardest parts? What were the parts that seemed insurmountable or um, devastating or uh, just tragic or depressing? Because we want to acknowledge the hard stuff. So question number one for both of them will be, what was the hard parts? And what were, how did you navigate the hard things? And then the second part is, what was the awesomeness? What, were, what was the power, the beauty, the enlightenment, the blessings, the gifts that came as a result of the faith crisis. And this can be a five, 10 minute conversation or it can be more because what we want to do is let people know you don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in sadness and desperation. You don't have to live in silence. Uh, yes, there will be hard things, but you can make it through the hard things. And most importantly, you can emerge as an authentic, happy, healthy human in or out of the church and you can find more joy more happiness, uh, more meaning, more authenticity, and more <coughs> emotional intimacy with yourself and with others than you would have ever thought possible. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about for the remaining part of the interview. What do you think? Sure. Can you guys do it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and, and maybe you've already talked about it and we don't have to spend even a ton of time on this stuff. We just want people to sort of feel like there's hope. Sure. So let's start with the hard stuff. Uh, let's start with you, Stu. What have been the hardest parts about this transition for you? The stuff you're not going to, you know, diminish or no. try to put a, a, a shine on. What have been the hardest parts for you? Um, yeah, so I mentioned my parents, um, disappointing them, making my mom cry. Um, I think I've always been the favorite child, and I'm not anymore. Um, I call that Nephi complex. Yeah. You had, the ne <laughs> you had Nephi complex, yeah. right? Uh, you loved being the golden boy, right? I, I, would, I don't know if I'd necessarily say I was the golden boy, but um, growing up, if you asked my mom... I was the, her spiritual child. I was the most sensitive to the spirit. Um, and, you know, in my adult life, like, she called me to come give her a blessing. And um, so I was really close to my mom, and we could talk about anything. And so that's been one of the hardest things, not being able to talk to my mom, who I love about everything and knowing that I hurt her and in my parents eyes being the one that destroys their eternal family um, you know they're older they're empty nesters that's kind of what they have to look forward to is heaven together with their family and that's that's what they want more than anything and I just went and effed it all up and so knowing that to them, I destroyed that as rough. You know, I, I don't want to hurt anybody. Um, and his, his mom loved doing like, <clears throat> temple days and stuff. He'd get, get all the daughters and we're all the daughter-in-laws, and we'd all go to the temple with her. Yeah. Like, that made her so happy because she never had daughters of her own. She only had sons. And so, like, she just loved, like, us all going together. And, but yeah, you know, all of us, all the couples. Relationship, and now I'm like not a, not a part of that. And I think that you makes can't go to too. those temple moments. Mm -mm. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things I you know it's hard. I wish I could do something about that. Going through it, um, the hardest thing is just the fear because you don't know where it's going to end up. Um, I'd heard all the horror stories of people's spouses leaving them. And I was honestly, I didn't know what Mel was going to do if I told her um, that I was starting to have questions. Um, I was hopeful that she'd stick with me, but um, I didn't know. And, you know, the fear of, I, I didn't ever think she'd leave with me. Um, I was hopeful that she would because being on the same page is better than not. Um, but I was afraid. Um, I was afraid to have my kids go to church and hear how important it is to have a righteous priesthood holder father and then not be that and have my, ch my own children think less of me. Um, I was afraid and I still kind of am of the kids in the neighborhood not wanting to play with our kids. Um, it's weird, you know, we've been in our house for 11 years, so the first seven-ish of those, we were there every Sunday. We were part of the in-group, and now we're not. And, and Cache Valley is kind of like Happy Valley, right? It it's is. It's kind of like Utah yeah. County, right? Yeah, like yeah. the whole small little world. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't yeah. excommunicated publicly. Oh, right. So I didn't have that shame to go through. Or, you know, that scarlet letter on my back. But I feel it a little bit, you know. I People know, and I know how people used to talk about, you know, there's so-and-so, he doesn't come anymore, look at him, you know. So I know how they talked about others, so I can assume how I'm viewed. And I know, you know, I left first, so I pulled Melinda down to hell with me. So... I guess that's right, you know. Just you—you you mentioned there was some point 
with alcohol where you're drinking more? Did you struggle with sort of a, a moral compass and trying things that you had avoided and trying to find a pace or a set point with that kind of stuff? I, okay, so... Um, <clears throat> like, Were there moments of depression? Yeah, yeah. Um, just, again, I think it was just a fear. Like, as far as the alcohol... Um, when I when I said I started drinking more, that was kind of in college. I okay. did a lot of binge drinking, and I I drink a little bit now, and it hasn't been. A, so you haven't gone crazy with I alcohol crazy. and mm -hmm. like. No. So for you, that hasn't been. It hasn't been, but that was you know navigating those things, you know, because I had resigned. I didn't believe in the church, and I don't believe in the word of wisdom, and so I wanted to be able to get together with buddies and have a beer, and I know. She was super worried about that. So those were things we had to navigate, and I made mistakes, and um, just drinking behind her back is, I'm like, I'm an adult, I can drink, but she wasn't comfortable with that. So we had some hard things there that we had to work through, but um, I don't think anything really major that. But that's some of the hard stuff to navigate, yeah. right? Is mm -hmm. you've had your moral compass set for all this time, you've sort of outsourced your moral authority, right. and all of a sudden, you're in charge of your moral decisions mm -hmm. and a lot of people screw it up a lot right. of people screw it yeah. up so bad they probably would have been better never leaving the church right yeah. sure i think maybe i'm lucky in that i partied and you know got it out of whatever your got out of my system you know at 20 rather than at 30 because nobody wants to see a mid 30 year old going out and partying up for the first time it's just it's not cool yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one did freak me out though, the alcohol thing, because I have like a brother that's an alcoholic and that's kind of kind of lost some of his kids and family over it. And so I had a lot of fears with that one. That one freaked me out. So that one took some time to navigate through. And then, but again, I realized like, okay, like he really wants to do this. Like at first it was kind of forcing him like, no, you're not, you're not going to do this, you know? And then so he had to feel like he had to do it like behind my back. And then I got mad about that when I found it. And I should have done, but. Yeah, which that's the part that's not okay, you know. But anyways, we worked through that. Um, but then it was like, okay, got to a point where he's just like, you know, I'm an adult. Like, I want to be able to make adult choices. And so then it was like, okay, let's put boundaries on this. So it's like, okay, what is when we have the social, because he gets social anxiety. Um, so it's like. Okay, just have one or two before a little hangout with your friends, and but I don't want you drinking alone. And so it was like putting rules on it and stuff, but at least he could do that, so that helped. And anyways, it, I just was afraid that it was going to change him. That I'm like, I've just only seen horror stories from my experience with my family and cousins and stuff like that, where I was just freaked out. I'm like, I just don't want to go there. Um, but then I realized, like, he's like, well, I'm just the same person. I might have one just to chill out a little bit, and that's it. And so it's like, all those fears that I had, it's like, they just, I didn't really, I guess, need them or wasn't necessary like he's still the same awesome person he doesn't feel like he has g g needs to get drunk and go be crazy he just like so it's been chill so it's like okay you know and yeah so it's like it's all right he's the same awesome person so i can let those fears go and it's not a big deal when i thought it was a big deal i made it a huge huge deal and it didn't really need to be that big of a deal so it's like it's it is what it is it's fine so yeah what about uh for for a lot of people they have this moment of like oh my gosh if I, if I hadn't been taught this, I would have believed differently. I would have married differently. I would have made different life choices. I would have done all these different things. If you had to deal with sort of the anger or the resentment or the frustration of having been fooled or deceived um, or however you would, you would describe right. it. Right. And, and I know people feel like, oh, if it wasn't for the church, I wouldn't have married this person. Um, or I wouldn't have had this many kids. Or yeah. Whatever. I, or career or whatever yeah i i probably wouldn't went on a mission if i could do it all over again um i regret the money i gave to the church um, <laughs> a lot of money in tithing <laughs> but overall it is what it is and you know i i had really good experiences too scout camp growing up was awesome um the church we grew up in it had one of the cool full gyms, not the little carpeted things that are horrible now. And my dad had a key. So we'd just go play basketball whenever we wanted, all the time. It was great. So, like, yeah, there's bad things, but 
I, I don't have, I'm not bitter, I, I guess is what I'm getting at. You're pretty it's, happy with where your life is. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to be like, oh, you know, I, I love our kids and we're done. We're not going to have any more, but, and I love my spouse. And so things turned out fine. So, yeah, and, and maybe again, I, I was able to party and, you know, do that before. So I don't, I don't feel gypped, I guess. Okay, how about you, Mel? You had to deal with regret or anger? No. No? No. Because that's common. I know. Re regret and anger. It's the thing with me, like, I'm not one that I never go into the past for pretty much anything. I don't care about the past. It's done, whatever. Like, I am all about, like, what's my future? Where am I going now? And look at the positive and where I'm going. So I'm not going to just regret because I can't change it anyway. So what's the point of going there? So honestly, I just... It's, you know, I had a good childhood being raised. I went, you know, went to college, graduated college, met him. Like, I love him. I would have never picked anybody else. I, even if I wasn't in the church, this is the guy that I would want to be with. And I feel lucky and grateful to have him as my spouse. And I've honestly, like, just fallen so much more in love with him going through this journey together. That's what was cool is, like, when he was out and I was still in, totally in, like, it just brought us closer together seeing, like, how he would be so sweet with me and like letting me like just respecting me to go to church knowing that I knew his views of like I just don't want our little kid to hear think less of me hearing these things about my kid you know like the priesthood dad the faithful priesthood dad and that's like not me and then the kid come home and be frustrated and so I knew like he wanted me to be out but I was in and I respected him for him being out on his journey and he respected me and it just brought us closer together so I know there's a lot of people that can drive a big wedge between their relationship and can cause a lot of problems. But for us, the fact that we just said, no, like, I'm like, I'm going to love this person no matter what. And we're going to work through this together. And I get to respect the other person where they're at. It like just brought us so much closer together and it was awesome. So even in the middle of it, even when we were, you know, on two completely separate pages, we were happier than we had ever been during that time where a lot of people can say this is just horrible, this is the worst. And I would just say just love the other person and let them be where they're at on their time. Let them figure it out without and try to let those fears go. I know that's hard. But you've got to figure out a way to just take a deep breath and just not let those fears overcome you and then have you get resentful and hurtful to, towards your spouse. You can make it work and be really, really happy and actually be better than you ever thought you could. So, Yeah, I don't want to hold you up as a role model in terms of the outcome because at the Open Stories Foundation, we really feel strongly that we don't care whether people stay or leave in the church. Yeah. We don't care if they believe or not. Like, sure. But what we do want is to avoid marriages dissolving that, that are otherwise healthy marriages, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And people getting sad and depressed and anxious when they don't necessarily have to. So the way I do want to hold you up as a role model is, is Mel, is how how gracefully you were able to handle his disbelief and disaffection and how like there are so many people who are suffering in marriages where they've just grown apart they they view each other as a disappointment they view each other as being fooled and as deceived yeah. and they lose respect for each other and then it becomes this marriage where you're just hiding who you are you're not talking to each other. You're judging the other person, growing farther apart, building up this resentment, living these separate lives, and it just gets super ugly and desperate. Yeah. And you're sitting here telling us that it actually brought your relationship closer. Absolutely. So how in the how in the world, if if there's a non-believer and a believer that are listening, in that desperate state of um, of separation and anxiety and sadness. What tips can you give Stu, the non-believer, and Mel, what tips can you give the believer to help them move from a place of isolation, desperation, and sadness to a place where actually their marriage is stronger than ever? That yeah. seems, I'm sure there's people listening who are saying, that's never, yeah, that's never going to happen. Yeah. So Stu, what are the tips you'd give the non-believer? Um, don't hide from your spouse because that's never going to help. Um, be vulnerable, and, and that's something that I always had a hard time with. Um, but luckily, Mel was 
willing to listen to me. Um, and again, I I try not to like badmouth the church or badmouth Joseph Smith or, but I I was just vulnerable and honest and like this is where I'm at and this is what scares me and we were able to have deep meaningful conversations um, you know instead of laying in bed at night just going good night like we'd stay up super late just talking about things that were important to us where when you're in the church and you both feel like you're on the same page like you don't need to talk about that because you're on plan, you're on yeah, program, right? Yeah, you're just, you're on autopilot, you're checking off the boxes, and so, um, yeah. yeah, don't, my original plan was to study, 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 then tell Melinda what I come up with, and that is the best thing that happened, is her catching me. Like look, at the beginning, you know, yeah. like seeing him go through the process, <clears throat> I could see the tears, I could see him just be broken hearted, I can see him so much tears of just like, oh my gosh, look at this. Like he was so just like kind of broken hearted with it and devastated and like I could see that. But like other people that go through it and hide that from their spouse and then once they get past that vulnerable phase, then you get to like the bitter phase. Yeah. And then when you're in the bitter phase and then you share that with your spouse, it's ugly. Or then you get past that and you're just like, I don't care anymore, I'm done. And the, that's like all or nothing for this other spouse. You've got to realize that's really scary for that person. And not, they don't even have a chance. So like everyone doubles down. This person doubles down where they're at. This person does. And it just doesn't work. So I, at least in our experience, I feel like it was very beneficial early on for him to be honest with me. So then he could share things. And that's the thing for me is like, or the, one of the spouses, like just, and both of them, just listen. Just listen to the other person. Don't try to defend the church. Like, I know you want to do that because you, it's everything. It's your world. Like, I married him because of his beliefs. That's why I married him. If he didn't believe in the church and he couldn't take me to the temple, I wouldn't have married him. So I understand when people are going through a hard time and they're like, no, this person's different. They changed. I married him for his beliefs. He changed his beliefs. That's why I need to divorce him. I get their thinking of why they feel like they're going to go there. But that's just damaging and don't throw away a beautiful wonderful marriage and family and spouse because of that like and then I just think of what example are you setting for those kids if you have kids like oh all of a sudden one spouse doesn't believe anymore and so you just get rid of them and divorce them what do you think the kids gonna think the kids like man if I don't believe what mom believes because she kicked dad to the curb like I better make sure I believe or let my mom at least think that we believe the same things or she's gonna throw me away as her child you know, I just think that sets a horrible example and causes a lot of fear in children that doesn't need to be there. Um, so I think if you can, if you want to be a good example and have a strong family, then you show your children how to have a beautiful marriage and family even when someone else doesn't believe the same thing. Because you don't need to throw away a marriage. I get that it's big. I get that. I've had all of these same feelings. I went through my head and processed all of this. But I'm like, what example would I set for my kids? You know, if I stay with him, then they see, oh, look at mom and dad don't believe the same things, and that's okay. They still love each other, and they're going to work through hard things together. And then I'm thinking, what if Stu ended up coming back to the church 15 years from now? I threw him away and divorced him and took my kids, and then all of a sudden he came back to the church and been like, oh, maybe I should have just stayed with him. Like, <laughs> it just, I think the whole thing of leaving a spouse just over this, and I get why people do it, they'll say, well, I need to choose God. And that's what they think they're doing. And they think they're doing it for the right reason is I've got to, you know, God is first and then family second. But when I believe strongly in the church, when they talk about families are most important, I honestly believe that. And I'm not going to go over some organization or whatever. Like my family is the most important. And I just think to have a good, healthy society, if everyone could have a good marriage and take care of their children, it's going to be a beautiful world. But how are we going to have a good world and I'm, when I'm throwing away my husband because we don't believe the same thing? You know, like, it's just not necessary. You don't need to do that. And so, like, now we can teach our kids, like, and even if when I was in it, it's like, okay, he could tell our kids what he thought and what he believed, why he didn't believe things were true. And I could say, well, I believe it's true for this, or I go for church for this reason. What do you think, little guy? You know, like, let them have their own thoughts. Like, because we can't control the outcome anyways, no matter what we believe. I can't control who God is, if God even exists, what the afterlife looks like. 
none of us have control of that anyway, so why am I trying so hard to convince this other person to believe what I believe? Like, why am I so hell-bent on, I will leave you if you don't believe in a God and an afterlife and go to church? Like, that seems a little crazy and extreme to me and not necessary. And I think it's devastating when marriages and families split up simply over this reason. What about stopping short of splitting up, but instead just each looking down on the other, seeing each other as a continual disappointment? What, are your, what, what would you say about that scenario? That's super sad. It sucks. I, yeah, because I, I know people on both sides where the believing spouse, you know, is super disappointed in their disaffected spouse. And the disaffected spouse is like, oh, you're so dumb because you believe in this dumb church. And they're disrespectful and they're to, disrespectful the to each other. Yeah. And right? that's just, there's no place for that. So I wish I had a magic formula, but I just feel super lucky that she was willing to listen. And again, I, I never thought she was gonna join me on the dark side, um, but I'm just grateful that she was willing to listen because when you're going through that, it sucks so bad, you feel so alone and so isolated. And if you can't even talk to your own spouse about it, God, that sounds awful. So- There's a lot of people that that's how it is. That's yeah, it so we were able to just be open just be more loving. than we ever have. Yeah, like just be loving, you know, and practice unconditional love. I know that it's hard. It's really hard. So you've got to like, if you need to listen to positive podcasts or books or something to help you, to remind you to just have hope, be loving, unconditional love, no strings attached. You know, like when we committed to be married, I committed to be with him through the hot, through thick and thin, you know, through the good times and the bad times. You know, and so we get to work together and we get to figure it out. So in no place am I ever, like, unless it gets to abuse where it's a, you know, that takes it to another level, we're going to work it out together. And we're going to figure it out and we're not going to attack each other. We're not going to be mean. We're just going to be loving and we're going to listen to one another. Just try to keep your mouth shut. Put duct tape on if you have to and just listen to the other person out of love and respect and let them figure it out without trying to control their view or their thoughts or how they're feeling let them just be so just be be authentic be real listen be loving like that's just practice that you just got to do it sounds too simple yeah and yet it sounds exactly true <laughs> yeah. any other super hard parts before we talk about the good parts oh yeah i guess just mine i didn't really share my yeah what were yours hard. um you know just the family thing of course not wanting to hurt the family um friends that was hard i've got friends you lost friends I didn't lose friends. I haven't told them. <laughs> and these are like, hi. <laughs> What's that like to just be in, not be able to be fully authentic with close friends? That's the thing is I've actually, I started like, and these friends, we've been friends for over 20, 25 years. Cause you could sit these people down and say, hey, here's, here's my letter. Here's what happened. You decided yeah. not to do that. Why? Well, we, I started to, I think I tested the waters and said a few, like, I think I brought some stuff up cause I'm really strong with the, um, just loving and accepting like gay community out there, you know? And so I had brought something up thinking I like could explain it enough where they would get it, but then they would justify it. And then it just came back to Melinda, I challenge you to read the Book of Mormon. Um, Cause this was one of my return missionary friends and it just got into like, just kind of a downer of like, it got to like bearing their testimony to me and like they just didn't get it. And so I shut it down pretty quick. So that was just bringing up a few topics when I think, I mean, I was even still in yeah. then. I just, he had shared a lot of stuff with me and I was starting to have my own concerns and wanted someone to share with. Cause I didn't have, you know, I wanted family or friends or someone that I could like figure this out with and not feel like alone. I mean, I had him, which was great, but I still wanted to reach out to other people. So I tested that a little bit and realized like it kind of just strained it a little. It just made it weird and awkward. And I realized like, you know what? I only see these friends once or twice a year. We'll go out for a couple days, go to St. George and do an overnighter and have some fun with the six of us girls. We'll do dinner. So I'm like, there's no point bringing this up, making it weird and awkward, them feeling like they've got to be missionaries to me and bear their testimony to me, then be awkward and feel like, can we say a prayer with you? Like, I didn't, I just want them to be themselves. So it's kind of more like, I don't like people taking pity on me. So I'm like, I'd rather just avoid that. And I don't want them to feel sorry for me or not be themselves is all. So I just, 
that's the thing. I've gone back and forth. I'm like, and these are good friends. I really could share with them and they would love me no matter what. So I'm not afraid with losing them, but it's just, again, I don't want them to feel like, we know you're out. Can, can we say a prayer? Can we still do this? Like, I see them once a year. Let's just avoid that. What's the point? And they don't need to know. Let's just have fun when we get together. And that's worked out for you. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And, and I like it better that way. And same thing with family. I've shared a little bit with my mom, and but then I just realized, like people just, they get, and I tried sharing with my sister a little bit, and she would just, we'd just end up getting defensive because I just wanted her to understand what I'm saying, and she would want to defend everything. I'm like, but that's crazy. You're really, like, defending Joseph Smith and him doing all these horrible things, and they're like, but, 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 and it's just like, I don't want myself to get defensive and heated and argue with my sister because it doesn't matter. So for me, I do better just like, you know what, I'd rather just like not talk about it, not get into it. So we just live our lives and it just doesn't come up with his family or my family, with our friends, my business partner. Like we talked about it a little bit at the beginning and then I just realized like she doesn't want to hear about it. She doesn't want to know. Most don't want to know. They yeah, don't. They, they just don't, don't want to know because they just don't, they're afraid of if it, they don't want to go down that path, Super so it's scary. rather just stay away from it, you know? So, and I can get that. I can understand that, and it's okay. Like, that's okay. And I'm like, it's actually easier. I don't have to get into it. And, and I'm trying to get out of that phase where I don't feel like I need to talk about it. I don't need to go to different groups or gatherings. Like, I'm, already, I'm past that, the needing the other people, the bitter phase, like all of that stuff. I worked through it all pretty quick. And I'm just, I like to just have a ha happy life. I want to focus on the good and being a good person and being there for others and I don't need to have any of this be a part of it anymore. So okay. it takes time to get through that process though. That's useful. Any other yeah. super hard parts for you, Mel? Um, you know, just like neighbors and like, just not, I don't know, not being able to feel like I can really talk to people about it, um, knowing that I'm kind of the outcast of the neighborhood and not knowing what they think or whatever, but I guess I'm kind of like, eh, whatever, I don't really care anymore. People that I'm close to and friends with in the neighborhood, that's all I care about anyways. So the other ones, they can think or talk whatever they want. So. Yeah, just hurting family or friends and people not understanding me, that type of stuff is hard to go through. But you can get through it where you don't care as much anymore, like it's okay, let be, you know, that's it. So your old selves or any believer that's watching now would sort of say, wow, you've really traded down. You know, you've really, you've lost the light, you've lost the spirit, and you've lost your entire framework, you've lost the church. Like, now you don't have a way to raise your kids. Now you don't have a foundation for your marriage. Now you don't have a sense of morality or spirituality or afterlife or hope. Like, you've traded down on basically every level. So what I'm going to do is walk you through all the different areas that you as former believers or believers themselves would sort of say you've traded down. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you a chance to sort of respond and to redeem and ourselves no just you know because there's a lot of people in fear like well yeah it's only sadness and misery that i have to look forward to there's nothing good mm -hmm. there's no upside right all right so is there upside and I, i'm going to ask you stick with these questions i ask and i'll take okay. you through probably most of the things okay. that we're going to talk about is that all right i like it okay yeah. all right here we go so first question mormons know where they came from they know that they lived with the loving Heavenly Father before they were born and that they were sent to this earth to be tested, to be given a body. They had this sense of purpose of where they came from. You don't have that anymore. So, if, you know, is that an area where you've traded down? Um, no, that was comforting. Why? Knowing where, yeah, knowing the whole plan, thinking you're saved for the last days. Feel super special and awesome. I don't have that anymore. Now I'm just Stu. I'm just me. Um, that sounds like all downside for yeah, that one. Is super, that downside or is there upside to that? To being uh, just Stu. <clears throat> um, being Stu is kind of awesome though. <laughs> you know, I mean, having that whole big eternal perspective, I think it can have a downside also, and that you're always living for the sky cake you're serving your butt off in the church so that hopefully you can get a reward down the the road and i don't know um what there is before and what there is after all i know is i'm here now and i'm gonna love my family and my friends and be the best stew brown i can be and that's it and so it's given me a 
bigger sense of purpose because this is all I know I, I'm going to get and I'm not going to waste it on nonsense. So I think that's an upside. Yeah, like just the time with our family, like we get to focus on our family and not spend time like on these tedious callings that I'm all about serving people. I'm a generous person. I'm all about finding a need and serving, but I want it to be authentic and I want it to be somewhere where I feel like it's a strong need. So when I'm tied up with the calling that's cleaning or cleaning the church and then doing visiting teaching to people that are so busy that I don't even feel like they want me there anyways, you know, and I, but I've still got to go, you know, and I temple try work and genealogy, temple work, gen yeah. yeah, all those things that they say is service, service, service. When I'm like, and then temple work, you know, like serving the dead. Like I don't want to serve dead people. I want to serve the living. There are people that are hungry and starving and need food and clothing and all these things that I could be spending time making blankets and creating an organization or just spending my time, like helping other people that there's really a need. Like, yeah. Like I like to put my time into like, where I feel like there's a need and not feel guilty that I'm not doing the church stuff where it's like, well, we need to clean the church or we need to do this. It's like, it just feels like a burden and it's just, I don't feel like it's real, the real need that there's greater needs out there that I can put my time. So I like that. I like, I don't have to feel any of that guilt about that. And because we don't know, like you said, like there might be an afterlife. I, I can't control it either way. I like to still believe that there's something after. I don't know though. Um, but that's okay because really, I can't do anything about it anyways. So I can't change it or control it. And so now it's like, now I get to spend time like on Sundays, like with my family and like, we can just curl up and cuddle together. Like we'll sleep in and we'll make a big breakfast. And it's so nice having that day to just really just relax and enjoy. We'll go on a ride in the razor up in the mountains that are so close to us. We'll just like hang out and take it easy, jump on our tramp. Like it's a beautiful day. And at first I thought I had to like replace it. And we tried that, we re tried replacing you know, going to the Mormon church to, we went to the Alpine church up here. And one of the times we went, it was like, it was a really good message. It was about being authentic and how, how God doesn't have to, like, if you came to his house, you wouldn't, he wouldn't have to like hurry and shut the closet and hide anything in the closet that's dirty or any messes. It's just, it is what it is. It's clean and nothing to hide. And that was nice. And then the second time we went, it was something that we didn't really jive with. It was, didn't really feel right or good to us. We're like, you know, we just didn't, I don't know. So we kind of just decided, you know what? We don't want to replace it with something else. We don't need something else. I don't need something else to tell me what to do and how to be. I love being free to just talk about whatever we want and be free to just decide what feels good to us without someone telling us what's right and wrong. Like we don't need that. We're good, solid people with good hearts. And I feel like we know how to make right choices and raise our kids with really good things without having guilt and shame hovering over them. So it's been good. Quality time now with the family. Thinking about the original question, like knowing where you came from, you know, and Mormons believe that, man, if you were if you're born white and in Utah, you must have been super awesome before you came here. And so you you're a little arrogant, like it's good being humbled a little bit that I'm not special. I'm just I was born here and like I'm not better than anybody. And that's a good thing. Why well, is that a good thing to lose your belief that you're better than everybody? Because then you're not an ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're right. It's a burden. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking you're superior. Yeah. And have to live up to those and expectations and or pretend like you are and fake it if you aren't. Or yeah. just you should never feel like you're better than anybody else. You yeah. can be special and good and whatever, but not any more than anybody else. Yeah. yeah. So. What about an idea of a Heavenly Father that is watching you and loves you and cares about you when all else is sad and hard? You've lost, maybe you've lost that a little bit. Mm -hmm. How's that not trading down? Uh, again, that can be a comforting thing, um, but it can also be a crutch that you rely on, that um, things happen not because of anything you do, but because you're either being punished or blessed. And that's not really the way the world actually works. Um, if you want to make something happen, you got to get out and work your ass off and make it happen. And I think knowing that whether we succeed or fail, some of it's luck, but some of it is just working your butt off and letting go of that crutch that if I'm happy, it's because I'm being blessed, or if I'm not happy, it's because I God gave me a trial. It's 
Yeah. It is what it is, and it's up to me to make the best of it, not some bearded guy on a cloud. Yeah, I think it's good taking responsibility and accountability for your own life. And if something happens, not just having, oh, just blame it on something else. Like I used to use the word trials, like, oh, this trial and all this. Like I don't even use those words anymore. I don't believe in trials that someone's punishing me or because that's a lot of pressure. That was actually a heavy pressure feeling like the reason this happened is because I didn't pay the full tithing this month or I didn't read my scriptures every day. And it was like, all it was was a burden, a heavy burden of like, I wasn't good enough. And so to realize like, that's never the case. It's like, this happened just because sometimes stuff happens. Sometimes someone down the street is gonna drink when they drive and I'm gonna get in an accident. And it's not because God had control over that. It's so easy to put everything on God, like everything happened for a reason. and. Maybe it does, but like I don't think God's the one playing this puppet thing or it's just it happened. And so it's like it was an experience that happened. This is the journey of life. And, you know, I get to choose how I'm going to be and react. And it's just it is what it is. So it's actually kind of relieves a burden of putting responsibility and accountability like on ourselves, which I think we should have rather than just like, oh, well, it's going to happen anyways. And yeah, I think it's empowering to take yeah. control of your own life. So there's the upside. That one. <laughs> All right, so the belief in Jesus uh, helps a lot of people feel bad about the mistakes they make, right? But yeah, you make mistakes and sin, but there's this loving Jesus who's there, who atoned for your sins, who's there to make it all right. And, uh, and, and that way, all your sins can be wiped clean uh, before God. You've lost that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but I've also lost the idea that there's some balance sheet in the sky that you know, how many good things did he do versus how many bad things did he do? Um, so I don't worry about that, but repentance is also a, it, it can be used as a, eh, you know, it's okay if I treat somebody poorly because I can always repent. Um, the reality is you can't take things back. If you're a dick to somebody, like if you say, if you say something hurtful, you can't take it back. And so I think it's made me more mindful of how I treat people. And I don't believe in sin. Like if I drink a coffee, I don't think that's a sin. But I do still believe in being a good person. And so I try to just treat people the best I can because I don't think I you know, can just have a, oh, I can take the sacrament on Sunday and now I'm clean and it doesn't matter that I was a jerk. A lot of believers will say, well, why even bother being a good person? You don't believe in God or Jesus anymore in our afterlife. Why would you even bother? You just go out and do whatever you want. I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, they're like, oh, you're just going to lose. You have no reason to be good anymore. What would you say? Yeah, I mean, I do as much sinning and murdering and raping and killing that I want to do, which is none. And that he did it when he was in the church. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, morality is more than just being obedient to a set of rules. It's just, if that's what you need to tell you not to kill somebody is a, you've got a problem with empathy. And I think, yeah, you need more help. Um, <laughs> I think I have empathy. And so that's what makes me not want to be a bad person to other people. That's what I care about now is how do I treat other people? Um, I can not love the sinner, or hate the sin. I can just love people and it is beautiful to not care where they're at, just to love them. And that is an amazing thing. Yeah. I just, I just feel like honestly, like people try to use the use like the church or gospel or religion or whatever of like to use that for a reason why people are good and I just don't like that and I don't sign up for that can of crap at all <laughs> like I really feel like people want to be good they were born that way they're born with good hearts they want to good be, be good people they want to see people happy they want to make people proud of them they want to do a good job with their job they want to impress the boss they want to do like for their own like I just feel like that's how people just are and religion tries to take that and act like the reason these people are good is because they gave them these rules to follow. Like, if I wasn't, I've got some cousins that weren't born in the church and they're amazing people. Like, they're good people. They 
do good things. They put themselves out there. They're generous with their money. Like, you know, like cousins on my mom's side or whatever, like that wasn't ever a part of the church. Like anyway, so there's, I've known personal people that it's like, they're not part of religion. They never were. And these are amazing, incredible people. So I've seen the proof of like, and just knowing people, people have good hearts, at least the people that I know and in or out of the church. And, and once you start hearing people's stories of why they've left religion, you realize like, oh, they're not a bad, horrible person. They actually are amazing, strong people that left from integrity and honesty and they want to be better people. But most people that are in the church won't take the time to look at that or believe that because they automatically just judge it and say it's because they want to sin, they're bad people because that's what the church teaches because it's a fear-based church so i don't sign up for any of that so yeah so a lot of people are like why uh you know my marriage is going to fall apart if we don't have this gospel um to to bind us together if we don't have the law of chastity to keep us from sleeping around if we don't have the church then it's just going to be debauchery and infidelity and and uh why even bother why not just go out and sleep with whoever and be with whoever? How, you know, so have you traded down in your marriage? <laughs> no. We no. like upgraded so much. How? How? How's that because, possible? Because we love each other. I mean, it's simple. Yeah. If you love your spouse, you're not going to want to go sleep around and you're not going to want to do anything that's going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And through this process, we grew so much closer and my love for Melinda grew so much. Um, because I was able to feel that, I mean, she really cares about me. She's willing to listen to these hard things that I'm telling her. And, you know, she, she chose me over this organization when other people don't. And that's a beautiful thing. So I, I wouldn't want to do anything that's going to hurt her. Um, because we've been able to build this beautiful marriage. And we have this great family. We got these beautiful little kids and I'm not gonna mess that up just because I don't believe in that Joseph Smith was a prophet. That's just stupid. So you're closer. Yeah. Definitely. We've been able to talk about so much more stuff on a deeper level. I felt like when we were in the church, it's like it tells you, it gives you all your answers. So what's the point of talking about anything? <laughs> now it's like, we talk about what do you think about the afterlife? What do you think about, do you believe in God? Do you not? And like, I love that I can just listen and I don't feel like I have to convince him of what I believe because I don't know and it doesn't matter. And we can just talk about anything and everything. And it's just, it's awesome. We, we talk about the d deepest things that we haven't before and it's like, that's amazing, and we, I don't think we would have ever gotten to this point and experienced that if we were still part of the church. So I feel like, thank goodness, we were able to leave, and so now like we can talk about anything, and it's so fun, like any subject, nothing's off limits. So even talking about like sexual stuff, it's like, oh, what do you think about this or this? Like, do you wanna try this? Like, we can talk about it and just say, no, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that, or might be fun let's try it you know like so we can talk and it's like together like whatever we want to try like together and so it's like it's br brought that like way closer intimately like that is completely got like better sex is that what you're tons saying better, better sex. yeah <laughs> more often better like everything it's just fun it's exciting and it's like i don't have to feel fear guilt or shame of oh can't can't look at that oh can't talk about that oh can't say that oh can't because there's all these rules it's like no if we're okay with it we're married we get a you know yeah and it's awesome <laughs> it's really good so yeah probably one of the biggest scary things for people is this this idea of how do you raise healthy happy children without mormonism mm -hmm. like they'll become prostitutes and and drug dealers for sure so have you just sold out your children for your own happiness without a real framework to raise happy, healthy kids and to be good parents. No, I think we can take the good things that we've learned from Mormonism, whatever parts we feel like, okay, that's a good thing that I believe is truth to me. And there's stuff that I'm like, okay, that's not truth to me. That doesn't feel good. I don't want to teach them that. So we can, and it's not, you know, that's the thing. Like anywhere I've learned any good information from books, anything that I feel like, okay, I want my kids to know this. We're going to teach that to them. 
And I love that we can take the best of the best and teach them that without having like, you know, the bad that comes with it. Because there is negative stuff that can come, like being raised, like I was lucky and didn't have any of issues, but I know some people that have, some kids that have heard talks that like literally that's messed with them their entire life of feeling they're not good enough or they've messed around sexually before they were married or they got raped or something and then they feel like they can't ever get their chastity back. And so it's like this cloud hovering over them and like how depressing. I don't want my kids to hear those lessons at all. Yeah, um, our kids will never hear the chewed gum. They will never feel guilt or shame over something natural and healthy like masturbation. Instead, we can just teach them empathy and to be kind and caring and hopefully still try to be examples of people that are charitable and giving. Um, I feel like our home is always open to anybody, anytime, and hopefully they can see that that, hey, our parents are nice to other people. They don't try to screw people over. We're both self-employed in our business and we don't have this cutthroat, in order for me to get ahead, I gotta step on you mentality. And so that's our goal and our, de yeah. is just raise them by example to be kind people and I think they're gonna do great. Yeah. Have empathy, be loving, be generous, and we're doing that. We're out of the church and we're doing that. You know? Someone say that's not enough. They'll have sex as teenagers, they'll try alcohol, they'll try drugs. Well, so does like, half the Mormons I know. What's your point? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's terrifying for a lot of people. I don't want my kids trying alcohol. I don't like you. Uh, and you, you know, you did try it and you didn't. Mm -hmm. Like But the outcome is the same. It all turned out just fine. <laughs> right. And so these fears are just these fears that people have and it's just they don't need to have What them. if they have sex before marriage? It's, Ask what percentage of Mormons do that before they're married. Probably well, most of them. Like, it happens. And I think we can the teach world. them. Fine. You know, because yeah. there are real world consequences to STIs. You know, having sex. Pregnancies. Yeah, and so we can teach them. Hey, you know, you need to be smart and safe, and wait until you're ready. Not because you're going to lose some invisible virtue, but because there are real world consequences. So we can teach them about that. And just like whether they were in the church or out of the church, it's ultimately up to them. We're not gonna have any control over that. And so the best you can do in either situation is teach them the best, but I think we can, you know, teach them not out of just guilt and fear, but just more practical, you know, yeah, and I have open communication. I want my kids to be able to talk to us. If they do mess around and try something or experiment with something, like I want them to be able to talk to me because I didn't have that growing up. I never had the sex talk with my parents. We didn't talk about anything. Like I just had to figure out things on my own, talk to my friends. Like he knew more about my body than I did when we got married. So we just didn't talk about it and talk about it with my friends, my parents, nothing. So it's like it doesn't matter if you're in the church or out of the church. Like we can. Just because we're not in the church and they don't go three hours on Sunday, we can still teach them good things. And just because we left the church doesn't mean all of a sudden we like don't want to be good people or now we're like, all right, it's cool to get drunk all the time and have drugs all the time. Like, of course, we're still going to teach our kids that's not going to be good and the damaging effects of it. But at least I'm going to talk to my kids about it. Even though my f parents were straight arrow Mormons, like they didn't talk to that. I think it's more important and our kids are going to get more out of it being able to have open communication with their parents and feel safe to talk to them if they do mess up or whatever. It's like, it's okay. And I'm not getting guilt and shame and be like, you did what? Like, gonna be calm about it and be like, okay, well, do you think that was a good idea? Like, we're gonna talk about it and it's gonna be calm and I'm not gonna freak out about it. So. I, I grew up with a, because I told you so, that's why mentality. And, you know, the church is the authority. You don't question. My dad's a patriarch of the home. You do what he says. And so I'm hoping to be able to, you know, son, this is why I don't want you to do drugs. And what do you want for your life? And, you know, is this gonna help you get there? And just to have more conversations like that instead of just don't do that because you'll go to hell. I think the same way we were able to have 
better and deeper conversations. That's what I hope with our kids is we'll be able to, you know, actually be open instead of like me just at 18 be handed the for young men only pamphlet from Boyd K. Packer. That was my sex talk. So I don't think that's healthy. So if your kids make unhealthy choices or even harm themselves, your Mormon brain or your believing family or friends will say, see? Oh, I guarantee see? They yeah. Look, you left the church and now your kids have, have hurt themselves. Can't control that. Well, what, well, what would you say? That. Like, you could. You could just stay in the church. Like, yeah, that has nothing to do with it. What do you mean? What about your kid? <laughs> they went through the same thing and you're in the church. Yeah, there's... People will say that, and we can't control it. Yeah. But what, um, what would you tell yourself when your Mormon brain says, well, maybe I shouldn't have left? I know it's not because I know too much. I would never go back What there. do you know? I know the truth about but where about, it came about from why, and how hurtful it is. But what would you say to yourself about, well, my kid made bad choices. Maybe they wouldn't have made those choices if I had stayed in. That's just still fear-based, and we're choosing to not be live our life based on what ifs and fear and I don't know what my kids are going to end up doing but I, I, I think that is a natural you know uh, you know maybe yeah. this led to that but you never know so I just yeah I don't I don't know I don't have a great answer on that one but I'm gonna not worry about it I don't look at the church positively anymore so I feel like I wouldn't even go there because it's like I think it would probably be worse off if we were back in the church because they would have heard all these hurtful messages and feel like how, how me, I live my life on fear, guilt, and shame. So maybe they messed up on this one thing, but at least they're probably way better off in all these other things. It has nothing to do with the church or not, it has to do with what I taught them and took responsibility for in teaching my kid. And, and hopefully their self-esteem isn't tied into their worthiness, like mine was in high school. And so I still think they're gonna be better off. Yeah, and like you said, Mel, Utah is full of depressed Mormon women, you know, porn addicted young men and women, uh, people living in shame. Uh, suicide rates are super high here in many demographics. There's plenty of, uh, you know, <laughs> prescription drug abuse and drinking, sure. and like there's, it's not like that's not happening inside the right. church, yeah. right? It's just that's what our brains and the believers pull out yeah. when they want to sort of stick it to you for yeah. something going wrong, right? But yeah. and that stuff's going to happen anyways, but I'm like more appreciative that we're out of it because at least they're not going to have gear, guilt, filth, and sh whatever, fear and shame hovering yeah. over them yeah. to not only did they make this sin or whatever you want to call it, they did that, but then they have all of this heaviness on them. That's really hard to be inspired and to like live your full who you are and who you're meant to be and be authentic when you have that weight on top of it. I would rather my kid not be taught that this is horrible, 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 and then they do it. Like, if they weren't taught that, then it's just just the act, whatever they did, and then we can just talk about just it. Just learning. But to try yeah. to clear all... Instead it, of transgressions, right. it's yeah. just learning. Yeah. <laughs> and it just creates exactly. more levels and weight on top of it that I'm like, my kids aren't going to have that. And I'm grateful for that. So yeah. no, they wouldn't yeah. have been better off in the church. It would have been worse if they would have gone through this. One so. of the benefits of being Mormon is just this amazing ward community of like yeah. all these neighbors that'll bring you casseroles and visit you when you're sick and visit teach and home teach you and they're looking out for you and if you need someone to mow your lawn, they'll do it. And you've lost all that. So you've traded down in community, right? At first it felt like that um, because you do, you, you lose that sense of belonging and um, but we reached out and through Facebook, we found groups of people that have gone through the same thing and we've made closer friendships than we ever have. We've been in our house 10, 11 years. We're friendly with all the neighbors, but there aren't any that like I feel super close to and you'd see them every week at church. Um, but I think just in the last couple of years, we've made friends that are so much closer and it makes you realize that, oh, those relationships and that community is superficial and shallow in some ways. Um, 
Yeah. So again, I, I feel like as far as friendship, we've traded up. Yeah, and we found other people that we could relate to that have gone through the similar thing that we've gone through with. Because it's, it's hard, it's big when religion and being part of the Mormon church, especially in Utah, it's everything, you know, that is everything. That's your world, that's your friends, that's your family, that's your activities. Just everything revolves around that. So it's a hard to go through that. But once you shift out of it and meeting friends that have also gone through a similar journey, journey as us of leaving the church, like you just have that like closeness of like, oh my gosh, like you get me. And like we've gone through hard things and you just bond and are closer to people automatically. You don't even have to talk too much and you're just like, you've been through this, <gasps> you know. And it's the same thing for the church though. When you find like people that go out of state or somewhere else and they move in and it's like, it's you're instantly like, oh, here's your people in your community. of in the, So anything that you're a part of, just find a group that you can relate to and it's out there. You know, there's so many awesome groups. So yeah, we met some amazing friends that we like hang out with all the time. And we have karaoke parties and we have dinners together and we laugh and like we can be real. And I love that we can talk about anything. Like no, just like with me and Stu, like we can get into all sorts of crazy conversations and like it doesn't matter what people think. I, I don't feel like I have to like try to steer them to believe a certain way. It's just like I can just listen and some of the stuff that my friends do, I'm like, okay, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that, but that's cool. But it's so fun just talking and hearing what people are doing and what they think and what they believe and rather than more of this robotic world of what's the point of even asking you what you think because we all think the same thing. We all do the same thing. You know, like, it's beautiful. It is so refreshing. Yeah. The go to... F- yeah, so much better. <laughs> go to any ward activity and you have the prayer, you have the little activity, you have the dinner, and then everyone goes home. And it's and, just small talk. <clears throat> yeah, and now we have, you know, get-togethers. We can talk about Oasis if you want. Um, which I think is great, but I also love my Sundays. So, um, but, but you but get together. What, how's you it get different? together. It, it's different because, like, we'll have a you know a, a pizza party at our house, and people stay till midnight because you have like deep, meaningful conversations that aren't shallow, and people want to stay and hang out. It's not people come and eat and then jet. Um, yeah, it was never like that with any of our church and we plan activities we're social people we plan get togethers we'll do outdoor movie nights at our house but it would just be the i mean the stuff we would talk about is our callings how old's your kid what grade are they in like this is how visiting teaching small talk would be and then we'd give the message and leave like that's just how it is with people in that and it's like oh can't talk about any sex stuff or ask anything because it's that's sacred or whatever and so like how am i ever learning about this stuff when it's like you can't talk about anything ever it's just crazy world why can't we talk about it? Like we can have different views on it, but can we at least talk about it? I feel like there's so many things that you can't talk about, or if you're going to talk about it, you have to make sure you're going to line up with what the other person believes or other going to be an issue. Like it's just weirdness. It's so nice not having that weirdness at all and just keeping it real and talking about anything. And like, Oh, it's just like, I don't have these heavy weights. Yeah, it's I'm refreshing. Carrying. It is refreshing. It's really nice. So you can find community and friends and our friends still, we have a baby. You'll get gifts. Someone's, we're going to make you food. Like, they're going to do that with that community. So even though we don't have the LDS community, we create a new community and we get all those great things that we used to get out of the LDS church. So you don't have to be left alone. It helps to reach out a little bit and find the activities. Like, we had some friends that moved from Colorado and they put something on this little Oasis Facebook group that's up in Logan um, that they they were going to do a waffle party because they're like, we got to meet some friends. So they did that and we're like, these guys are awesome. So now they're in our little friend group and we hang out with them all the time. Um... Yeah, so it takes some work. You can't just show up and all have an instant community like you do in the church. But if you put in a little time, put in a little work, you'll find a community and, in our experience, have deeper, more meaningful friendships. What if someone were to say you've become worldly? Now it's just all about making money <laughs> and buying toys, but you've lost that deep sense of spirituality. Yeah, um, I th- we've actually heard that, I think. Um, well, it's just funny, though, the timing, like, because my business started really taking off after I left. <laughs> like, it started getting, like, really successful. Satan has blessed you. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> so I'm sure people look at that. We started buying toys and, like, lots of fun stuff and having fun. Um, but I'm like, even if I was in the church, it would have been the same thing. Well... Like, I still would have, my yeah, business would have I, been successful. I still would have brought in the same amount of money. There would have been no difference, but... What about spirituality, though? 
Like, what if someone says you've lost the spirit? Yeah, you've got all this friends and money, but you've lost the spirit. So what's it for? What's their definition of the spirit, I guess? I don't know. I don't know. Either. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I mean, um, I, I think you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Are you still spiritual? I don't believe in a God or a Holy Ghost. So in that sense, no. I try to be contemplative and... Um, yeah, not really, I guess you'd say, but I, I do try to just be a good person and focus on the here and now. And so if that's just being worldly and if wanting to spend time with my family up in the mountains having fun is worldly rather than being in church, then yep, I'm worldly. <laughs> but this is all I know I'm going to get, and so I'm going to make the best of it. And if that's having fun, if that's playing on toys... And bringing our family closer together and spending time together yeah. as a family, then okay. I say we trade it up. Yep. So. All right. So it sounds like you're trying to convince us that you're stronger in your personal mental health. You're stronger in your marriage. You're stronger as parents. You're strong. You got better friends. It, it sounds like you're trying to make the case that you're pretty much happier in every way. Yeah. Mel, uh, Mel, is that what you're trying to tell yeah. us? Yeah. And it honestly is like, it really is. Like, I feel like I was, like, carrying... It's weird, because I was happy in the church. It was great. I never doubted or questioned anything. But now being out of it, I, I was taught this lesson. I've heard it a couple times, like, when I was a teenager, that, like, sin, you'd have a backpack, and anytime you'd sin, it's you'd and they'd get rocks. They had rocks, and you'd put a rock in your backpack. And if you didn't repent and you sinned again, you'd add another rock to it and it'd get heavier and heavier. Being out of it now, seeing both sides... I feel like I had always been carrying around this backpack with rocks and didn't even know it. So I always had this weight of like, you know, just their lessons are like, you're never good enough. Even if you, um, you know, God will always, even if you do something good of service or something, like God's going to bless you and so you're going to owe him. You're always going to owe him. We're nothing. Like some of these stuff that's like, it just wasn't inspiring. It's just like, you're not good enough. You're and there's never always enough. more you're never doing. There's right. always more you should be even doing. Even if you obey everything, you can't do it. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So even though I was a good person and I did most all that stuff, you know, in college, me and my girlfriend would go once a week to the temple and do baptisms for the dead. Like once a week, we'd get up early before our job and we'd go and do that. Like I had solid friends like that. So we would do, you know? Um, so even with all of that, like I just still feel like there's just this weight carrying that you're carrying all the time and so to let that go and be like oh my gosh like I'm free I can just be I can make my choices they're still pretty much the same choices that I'm making that I would have made if I was in the church and the ones that aren't exactly the same I don't have to feel guilt and shame over it because it's like me and my husband are on the same page we get to decide what we want to do for our life we love our children we children we are teaching them you know good things for them to be a good kid so your f kids don't have to be afraid to be friends with our kid like we're not you know you don't have to be afraid of us and like good solid people that are going to treat you good and you know. so your backpack's lighter yeah it's backpack's lighter like you don't feel broken anymore because the church convinces you that you're broken and only through them can you get the cure and now i don't have to feel that anymore and you know as far as our marriage um, before the faith crisis, um, I know Mel would resent me for not being the perfect Peter Priesthood. Even if I try to be, and I 100% don't blame her for that, because that's the, no matter how good I was, I could never live up to that perfect, idealistic priesthood holder. Um, and so if I wasn't you know if i'd rather watch monday night football than hold family home evening you know she'd resent me and she wouldn't come out and say it but i'd feel it and now i don't have to be perfect anymore i can just be good i can just be a good husband and a good father and that is enough and that is amazing feeling to know that you can finally be enough because in the church, I don't care who you are, you're never going to be enough. And so that's an upside. 
And so what if a believer says, but you're not really happy? <laughs> That's my favorite. Yeah. Don't get me started on that one, John. <laughs> no, I want to. What's your yeah, answer? I might get feisty. What's your answer? <laughs> you're not really happy. That's the thing that's just so funny. Like, first of all, like, one, I am, you know, and that's the thing, like, I've been there in the church, like, I know what their idea of happiness is, but like being out of it, I'm at a whole nother level of happiness, you know? Um, and the second thing is, how in the world can they get away with even saying that comment? Because do they have superpowers where they can jump inside somebody's body and really figure out like how they feel? and how they think, like it's just not possible. So to say someone's pretend happy or not really happy because they don't have the fullness of the gospel, it's just BS. And then, and then when you see the statistics of Utah and how many people are depressed and going to therapists and all this, these are people in the church. So obviously the church doesn't figure out how to make people happy. It's, I feel like it's doing the opposite. So it's just a story that they tell themselves to make themselves feel better. But no, I'm honestly like happier and so you and you can't tell me that I'm pretend happy because I've been there. Like maybe you can try to fool that card. You've done pretend that's... happy. Yeah. Yeah, I've done pretend happy. <laughs> that was pretend happy. Yeah, we I have a perspective. Happy. We've been on both sides, and so they they haven't been on this side, so they should try it out because yeah, then they can actually say if they're happier or not. Um, the idea in the church of you know enduring to the end and that. That doesn't, to me, that doesn't spark feelings of joy and happiness. It's, it feels like a slog that you just have to get through life by just trudging through it. And that is unhappiness to me. And so now we get to just enjoy it for what it is and try to be good people. With no extra pressure. Yeah. And so... Yeah, I've been on both sides, and I know they'll say that, but yeah. it sure feels a lot better. And until you're in other shoes, like you just really can't say anything. And I feel like even if you are in both shoes, you still got to be careful because you s didn't have the same experience as this person. So I don't know. Like I said, there's not a one size that fits all for anything in this world, for religion, for schooling, for happiness for music, for anything. That's why it's so beautiful that there's so much variety. I like think about like, oh my gosh, you know, like, oh, like some people would say, oh, how amazing would it be if everyone was able to get converted to the church and everyone was Mormon? Wow, it'd be such an amazing, beautiful <laughs> world. And I'm like- Except for the gays. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just picturing like white shirts and ties and dresses and just like these robots just all doing the same thing. Go to church, come out. We're sitting there family home evening. It's like all looks exactly the same. I'm like. That's not a beautiful world. What's the point of going to another culture and seeing another country and all the churches look the same and the buildings and the people, like everything looks the same? That kind of sounds like my idea of hell. You know, so I'm like, no, I love the diversity. I love people's different thoughts. I love people dance around the fire and that's how they get their spirituality or they do meditation and that's what they do on their Sunday. Like all the variety, like find what works for you and just, it's nice to be able to have a chance to actually be able to figure that out. When I was in the church, there's no way. There was no space for that. It's like, no, this is where you feel good. This is where you feel the spirit. This is what you do. Okay, okay. You know, just, they give me all my answers. Like, that just, when you really think about it and step outside of it, like, it just sounds crazy to me and doesn't sound like happiness to me. So, yeah. All right. Any final words of wisdom for our audience before we close this uh, wonderful interview? I've got some nuggets. You got a few nuggets. Do you have any? Where did I put my? You phone? can pull out your phone and get your nuggets. Yeah, these were yeah. I just life's short, and so do what you need to do to be happy. Try to be a good person. Have empathy, and I think things will work out. That's. Uh, I don't That's have any Stu's nuggets. testimony. That Stu's testimony is just, just be because that's all you got. Mel, final thoughts? Um, all right, let's see. Oh, so one of my like fears was like not paying tithing. Um, I was really afraid. I held on to that for a long time because I feel like I had experiences that would happen like, you know, a day before our mortgage was due, like a check would come in that I wasn't expecting and we'd be able to pay it and different things. So it's just interesting now, like after. So I was really afraid not to. I felt like all blessings that we had was because we paid our tithing because that's what I've been told and taught. Um, so then leaving, 
though I still have those same experiences happen <laughs> where I'll magically get something the day before when I needed it. And before I would have, like I said, tied that to, cause I paid my tithing and I haven't paid my tithing in years. And so either God loves me or the universe loves me or things just work out and it's good. So I, I just know I had a big fear of that. So if other people are in that, like you don't have to fear like things are gonna fall apart. Cause there was times where it worked out, but there was also times where we bounced checks when we paid tithing. <laughs> We had to pay a $25 fee because we paid our tithing. So sometimes things worked out and sometimes it didn't, but I'd give it all the credit for when it did. So anyway, it's just, it works out anyway. Um, let's see. Oh, I think everyone on their journey, like there's a place for everyone. So if people are feeling good, like, you know, in the church and they want to make a difference within the church, then I say, stay there, stay there and do that because I think it would be really kind of a scary world if all the people that started doubting completely left and it was all black and white and you have the people that left that are either all out or all in. I think that's kind of scary for the kids that are in to be taught that. So it's good to have people that can be in it and help teach these new youth that like, it's okay. Don't need to get so worked up. If you don't believe everything, it's okay. Like, so I think there's a place for everybody. So that's why I would never push anybody to like, even though we're extremely happy where we're at, like I said, I couldn't have been this happy, like in the middle of it. Like I needed to go through my journey on my timeline. I was able to go through pretty quick. I feel like like a year of being in and then being, being out. Some people go through years and years and years, but everyone's timing is different and they just have to fill it out. Um, but just own where you're at, be authentic, be you, make a difference where you're at, just, or just be. Just be you without guilt, shame, or fear, and just, you know. Um, I guess one more thing I'd add is just, if anyone's, just starting to go through this um, or they're in the middle of it just you're not alone reach out anyone that knows me can reach out to me or reach out to people in your community or whoever or on Facebook but you're not alone there's so many people and because I, I know that made a huge difference for me finding people that I could relate to that were going through this and so maybe 20 30 years ago before the internet maybe you really were more alone but now you're not and find people to you know share it with because that will make a huge difference so reach out mormonspectrum.org the community maps there is a great yeah. place to find face-to-face -face communities in whatever city you live on the planet yeah. so check out mormonspectrum.org yeah. Mel, any other final? Yeah, just really like, just be loving. Whatever space that you're in, wherever you're at, just take a deep breath. Get the resources that you need to help you. Like I know that it's hard to shift past. This is big, big, deep stuff. I get it. Being taught 33 years of your life, something is, this is the way it is. And trying to shift that, it takes time. So be patient with yourself. Um, you might go through those phases of sadness and anger and it's okay. You don't have to push through it. Like, just get through it. Just be careful not to put that anger on the other people that you love around you. But just practice having unconditional love with no strings attached. No matter wherever your spouse is or friends or wherever, like, just be okay listening to them and just love them and realize there's a lot to it. It's complicated, but you can find happiness. That's the biggest thing. You can find happiness outside of Mormonism. It doesn't have to be freaky. You can still be good people. You can raise your kids with good morals and values. They can still have friends. You don't have to stay from the fear. And it can be a beautiful, happy, enriching life. And that's what we found. So we know that it can happen. So it's good. Mel and Stu Brown, everybody. Thank you guys so much for your willingness to share your stories with us. Thanks to everyone who's tuned in. We hope you found this to be useful. Um, we, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, everyone who makes this possible to all the donors of the, to the open stories foundation of mormon stories thank you so much for your support if you believe in what we do if you uh, benefit from it and if you want to see it continue and you're not already a supporter please consider a donation today at mormonstories.org uh, ten dollars a month 25 bucks a month 100 bucks a month whatever you can afford it's all tax deductible in the u.s it goes towards our mission towards our staff um, and it allows us to keep providing uh, podcasts, events, um, communities of support for those who need it. So we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, please tell your friends. Please like us on Facebook. 
Uh, please give us positive reviews on iTunes. Um, check us out on Instagram or on Twitter. But, uh, you know, please uh, do continue supporting us. Share this with others. It, it, as you know, it was, a, as Stu said, it was a friend of his that was willing to share openly on the Internet that sort of allowed him to see the world in a different way. And that means that many of you, when and if you're ready, please do share this story, other stories, how you feel, talk openly, um, not with any desire to take people out or take away people's belief, but just to be authentic and share. Just realize that by sharing your story, by sharing these Mormon stories, you can give people new opportunities for love, for better relationships, for better community, for being better parents, whatever it is, somehow be kind, be empathetic, be open, be authentic, uh, be vulnerable, and good things are going to come from it in or out of the church. So we love all you guys. Thanks so much for your support. Please stay tuned at Mormon Stories. Uh, please keep supporting us, and we'll see you guys again really soon. Take care, everybody.